Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon, Caitlin. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Kevin. Also, oh, and there. Uh, um, good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Caroline. I, um, um, I assume that was. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back, everybody, for good or for bad. Um, good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Savannah. Welcome back. Good or for bad. Okay, we're still. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay. Wait. And good afternoon. Oh, and there's more good afternoons in the chat. Okay. Hold on, I have to. Okay, good afternoon. I said Kaylin. Oh, there's more. Wait, okay. Um, so yes, good afternoon, Savannah and Caroline. Good afternoon, or Caroline and Savannah. Good afternoon, Caitlin and Amanda, who were super prompt. I think they even came in before 305. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Mackenzie. Good afternoon, Erica. Good afternoon, Stephen. Good afternoon, Amy. Good afternoon, Sumaya. Good afternoon, Adon. And I'm just going to repeat. And I am, OK, I'm repeating. I'm just repeating again, just so there's no, I do apologize. I do not have your exams back. Um, and, and you might have seen that in Google Classroom. And I, to be honest, I'm not sure they're going to be ready even for Wednesday. Um, I have no defense. I will say, I hope you guys enjoyed your break. I know for some of us, a break was not a break. Um, that was true for me. There, um, I was deep in other work for the department that doesn't help you directly at all. And I apologize. Um, but I'm so I'm still buried under the exams, but I will get to them. And I know the semester is flying. Oh, is this? Oh. Is this class 19 or 20? Uh, that's a good question. Wait, I thought it was, did I do something wrong in the Google? Sorry, there's a direct chat to me that maybe I did something wrong in the Google Classroom. Hang on one second. Hang on. I thought, I thought this was class number 20. I mean, not that, and it only matters if you think it matters. I mean, it, it, if you're not, but I thought this was class 20. Did I do something wrong? Oh, did I never post the notes from last class? Is that why somebody's asking? Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Uh, someone's asking something in the direct chat that does uh, maybe matter. I, well, I mean, it certainly it matters to that person. Um, hold on one second. I think I see why they're asking. Hang on. Wait a minute. And something is funny. Uh, sorry, and someone's in the waiting room. I'm sorry. So there's a the the, the question in the chat. Um, someone's asking in the chat: Is this class number nineteen or twenty? And just to be clear, like if you've never even paid attention to that, you don't have to. Like I, on the one, just any, just so you all know. I mean. I don't need you guys necessarily to keep track of exactly what class number it is. Um, and it, apparently I don't keep track very well, but I think the person is asking because when I post the videos in the class notes, I always number them. And it may be that I miss, that they might be telling me that you're missing a class notes. Hang on. Yeah, I see that the class notes don't seem, there may have been one day where you had a video, but you didn't have class notes. Is that possible? Something is funny in the numbering. I, I, I agree. I'm looking at it right now. I, I will look into this. There might, I don't think we're missing any documents. Uh, well, besides that, I have to get you your exams back. But I don't think, but I will look. I, I totally respect the question. Uh, Class 19, but something is funny. 
sorry, uh, that's just a, 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 an unexpected but relevant question. I will drop this topic in one minute and get back to you, but now it's got me. Yeah, something about the class note. The class notes seem to be one session behind the YouTube videos, and that is confusing. And I'm not sure why that is. And I will look into it if that's why the person is asking. Um, well, let me just see. Oh, no class 19 notes right okay that is why you're asking okay yes you're right and i'm looking at I, I thank you for asking direct chat person um but i just looked at the other sections and that seems to be true in the other sections also it seems i i will look into this again when the class is over it may just be that there was one day no class 19 notes i'll look one more time it may be that there was one day where Oh, no, I know what it is. I know what it is. Yes, yes. Okay, 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 okay. No, it's a great question. I, and again, if you, so the, it, it's good for people who are keeping track of what's going on. The videos are one step ahead of the notes because right before the exam, I uploaded an extra video for everybody about about question four in the exam, uh, an extra video that came from another section. So the, so I'll renumber them. That's what it is. The, the videos have one extra, there's one extra video that didn't correspond to an actual class we had. So the class notes are correct. The videos are numbered one. So this is class 19 for what it's worth. That's a good question. I will try to fix that when I get a second. Um, okay. Uh, but thank you for it. Cool. All right. And you get points for closing the loop on that question. Okay. Good, good point. Um, okay. So um, back to everybody. <clears throat> um, I hope you had an okay break. I know for many of you, if you're science students, you may not have had a break. Uh, and I apologize for that. And I know the semester is, we're, you know, we're getting there. And I, so I will try to get your exams as quickly as I can. I already have failed at that, um, but you will get them, obviously. Um, Right now, we're going to close down one last topic that we were doing right before the break, and then the rest of the semester is on a final topic. Um, well, to be clear, we're doing one last thing today on the Doppler effect, and then the, that transitions us to the rest of the semester, which is on electricity and magnetism, electro, specifically electrostatic fields, and electric currents and things of that nature. Um, it's, and I know you've, I believe, I'm gonna check with you in a second. I believe you've already started with that in the lab. Um, it can seem like a very strange jump from waves to fields. The big connection is that they are both unthingy things. Uh, they're both unthingy things Hold on one second. I'm sorry. They're both unthingy things. Um, and there's a more specific connection um, uh, that I want you to see from the Doppler effect itself. There's a reason we study the Doppler effect, and that is that it actually shows us the connection, a very important connection between waves and fields. Um, so I want to get to that connection or that transition today. Um, the way I want to do it um, is ask you, I, I, want to, I want to go over something you did in a lab board meeting. And I know you discussed it. I know you struggled with a certain problem. And then I know you got certain answers, but it, um, I want to review the implications of those answers with you. So let me check in with you right now and make sure I'm on the right page. When you So tell me in the chat, please. Uh, you did a a board meeting on Doppler effect in your lab, I, I think a couple of weeks ago. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Savannah, that was fast. Okay, great, great. Hi, I just sent you, hi. Mm -hmm. I teach, I know, this is the last class of the day. You said, just now, I, well, I, you said, I, I said hi 
Well, because you just sent one, right? Yes. Right. So I sorry, excuse me. So I said hi, teaching, which is what I'm doing. Okay, you can wave hi and then I got it. Oh, here. Okay, just wave hi and then I'm gonna. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um. Uh. Okay. So you did. And question also. Um. Back to you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, direct chat person. Thank you, Amanda. Awesome. Also, am I right that you did it with? You, your, your lab instructor is Melendez, yes? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you, this is also correct that you did it with him a couple of weeks ago, but then you even have gone on since then and you have in fact started or done a circuit, an electric circuit. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, great. Thank you all. Oh, yeah. You're doing it now. Okay. Great. 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 And thank you everybody for all your participation. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Direct Chappers. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Jose. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let me acknowledge a couple of things. Number one, I know that electricity is like seems like it's out of nowhere. And when you first sit down to sit do an electric electricity lab, for some of you, it can be very like, what the heck is going on? For some people, and I was one of those people, it can seem very not only out of nowhere, but also it can seem like a whole new branch of physics that uh, oh, okay. Um it could seem like a whole new branch of physics that um, doesn't seem to connect to anything that you've been preparing for or practicing for. I totally understand that. And the rest of the lectures after today, believe me, will be an attempt for me to connect everything to electricity and show you why you're doing it and how to make sense of it. Uh, there are some of you though, for whom electricity is so seemingly disconnected no pun intended, uh, no, so seemingly unrelated to everything you've done before. For some of you, if you feel like electricity or circuits in particular is like a fresh start almost, if you feel like you sort of, maybe maybe some of you have played with wires before, and some of you may feel comfortable playing with wires and playing with circuits, and you might even feel like, I think I sort of get what's going on and I'm the lab partner that everybody is like do, having, expecting to do all the work, even though I haven't been paying attention to physics class for a semester and a half, or, I, or even though I don't understand calculus to save my life. Like, if you feel that way, that's fine too. You're not faking it. There are some of you who might feel like you've never really maybe fully felt in the center of physics before, but suddenly with circuits, it does feel like you know what's going on. If you feel that way, hold on to it. You're not you're not kidding yourself. And you're not, and it is a fresh start. And that's good because there is something about electricity that is a whole practical endeavor unto itself that relates to people differently from the other stuff. So if it's an avenue for you suddenly to feel connected to physics or to feel strong, good. You're not lying to yourself. Like that is perfectly plausible. And if for those of you who feel like all of a sudden electricity is like like taking the rug out from under your feet, I understand that too. And we're gonna for most of the rest of the classes, not today so much. For most of the rest of the classes, I'm gonna try to get you to see how it does relate to everything we've been doing. And and but I was one of you. I didn't see. I mean, I was not good at it. Um, for the first a million bajillion times, I did it. But I do see how it all relates now. So there's hope. Um, okay. Um, so that said, I would like you to please. So we're going to do one last thing about waves. One last thing about the Doppler effect here. We're going to go over these findings that you got from your board uh, meeting and you were going to share with me. We're going to be a little bit in discussion oriented today, hopefully. Um, and this will be the last thing, uh, the last uh, session on on waves and stuff uh before we move on so um so can you please take out whatever work you did on the board meeting for doppler effect like whatever materials you have in your notebook I, and i know you didn't hand anything in but i just mean the work that you did that day in the board meeting on doppler effect if you can open your notebooks to that those of you who have it that would be very helpful for you to follow along what i'm about to do um we are going, so I'm going to, so stop me if I say anything that departs from what you did in your lab or departs from your conclusions. Um, yeah, I believe, so I'm going to look, and I know there was a lot in the board meeting. There were the pictures that you had to talk about and stuff. I'm just going straight to, I'm going to try to go straight to the 
heart of the matter, which is the problem, right? Where, uh, where you, there's a car that's blaring its horn and you're running away from the car and hearing the sound that the, the horn makes, right? Now, the way I'm going to depict it in my diagram, I'm depicting the car just as a speaker, as sort of a standard, like we're talking about sound waves here. In general, the, um, whenever I depict the source of sound waves, I depict it as like a speaker. And whenever I depict the receiver of the sound waves, I depict it as like an ear. I mean, it's obviously very cartoony, but that's what I'm trying to get across. And um, in the setup, as you have it from your board meeting, you had a speaker. And again, check what I'm drawing here. It's not gonna look exactly like you're drawing, but check if my numbers make sense and if my notation is consistent with yours. What I have here is a speaker in a car that is emitting sound at a speed of 340 meters per second relative to air, right? So it says VWM equals 340 meters per second. VWM means the velocity, the speed of the wave relative to the medium, right? And the medium, in the case of a sound wave, is air. So VWM is 340 meters per second. That is a given in the problem because that can always be a given with waves. That is the thing that is given with waves. That was our big conclusion like three weeks ago, you know, before you did the board meeting or anything, our big conclusion, our big finding about waves is that any given wave has a speed that is constant and fixed relative to its medium, that the parameters, the material properties of the medium for a wave determine the speed of that wave. So as long as the material properties of the medium are fixed, then the wave speed is fixed relative to that medium. Now, I, that is a, that's a huge discovery. And that is what distinguishes, well, that's one big thing that distinguishes uh, wave motion from particle motion. Right again, just again to emphasize this, you've heard your whole life phrases such as the speed of sound, which is really shorthand for the speed of sound in traveling through air at standard temperature and pressure. Right, but but you've heard those phrases like the speed of sound, you or you've also heard things like the speed of light or whatever. But the speed of sound you've heard and you might even know is approximately 340 meters per second, approximately like a little bit less than a thousand miles an hour. Right. But think about that for a minute. You get so used to those phrases. It's easy to forget that you never hear a phrase like the speed of a baseball. Well, you never you hear phrases like the speed of that baseball. That baseball might leave that pitcher's hand at 120 miles per hour relative to the pitcher. But baseballs in general don't go at any given speed. Right. A, any baseball could go any number of speeds, depending on how hard it's thrown. And the faster it's thrown, the faster it goes to the point where if I throw a baseball, even if I'm only muscularly capable of a 75 mile per hour pitch, right? I throw a baseball. Well, if I want, if I want to throw a pitch at you, that to you is going faster than 75 miles per hour, one thing I could easily do is run towards you while I throw the baseball, right? Or I could get in a car. And, and if the car is going at 60 miles an hour relative to the road or relative to you, and I throw the baseball out of the car, then, and, and this is not an obvious, well, I mean, this is an important contrasting point. If I throw a baseball relative to a car at 75 miles an hour, but the car is going relative to you at 60 miles an hour, then the baseball would be going relative to you 135 miles an hour. In other words, I can speed up a baseball by speeding up the source from which the baseball came, right? But that's not how waves work. J just to give you background again, to remind you a huge and somewhat mind numbing, I think, um, aspect of wave motions is that the, a wave does not travel at a speed that has anything to do with the source of the wave. The wave travels at a speed that has everything to do with the medium through which it's traveling. So once I make a sound 
sound comes out of my mouth and goes through the air at a given speed relative to that air. And even if I'm running forward or backwards or whatever, that will not speed up or slow down the sound relative to the air. It will travel through the air at a fixed speed, unlike baseballs, right? That is a huge discovery about waves that we made mathematically, um, but then has implications namely, or oh, uh, good afternoon, direct chat, good to see you. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, how'd you get it? Did I let you? Okay, well, whatever. Um, uh, 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 um, no, good to see you. Um, I am so distractible, aren't I? Uh, the Doppler effect then is an effect that applies to waves, all waves, we're studying specifically sound waves. The Doppler effect is what happens when the relativistic character of velocity gets applied to the medium dependent velocity of waves. The Doppler effect is a phenomenon that involves wave motion, oops, sorry, wave motion, and the relativistic nature of motion in general. Both are dry together driving the Doppler effect. Um, it's the relativistic nature of motion that forces me to write two subscripts on every single piece of information in all of these Doppler effect problems, particularly the velocities, right? Like all the velocities, you know, all the information here, but especially the velocities all have two subscripts after them because we're demanding, we're, we're, we're continuing this knowledge we got from physics 203 that says all, every velocity is a relation between two objects. It is never a mere property of one object, right? So every velocity to be properly designated uh, has to have two subscripts after it, referring to two objects um, which the velocity is relating. Okay, so, so in my diagram here, in my depiction of, 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 of the problem given in your board meeting in your lab, we've got the velocity of the wave relative to the medium is 340 meters per second, i.e. that's the speed of sound in air. We know that about the wave even before we begin this particular problem. That's the nature of waves. That, that can be given, period. But then we're also saying in this problem, okay, let's assume that the sound that's coming out of the speaker is coming out at a, 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 that the frequency of the sound the frequency of the wave relative to the source is 500 hertz. So again, and I think you had this in the lab, just like the key or the legend here is W stands for wave. I'm not going to write this again, but you please write it if it's at all confusing to you. W equals wave. S equals source. R equals receiver. And M equals medium. That's the notation I'm using here. And stop me if, if you need that again. Um, so the frequency of the wave relative to the source is 500 hertz. In and what we're well, and in this problem, the velocity of the source relative to the medium is zero. I.e., the source is just sitting still in the air. The velocity of the receiver relative to the medium, or I should really say the speed of the, like the, 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 the magnitude of the velocity, the speed, the, the, right, the, the, the speed of the receiver relative to the medium is 44 meters per second. That's a given in the problem that you had in the board meeting. Now, notice that speed. I'm not specifying yet whether, whether I call that negative or positive in my calculations will depend on decisions that I make, which I'm about to make. But all that's given in the problem is that the speed is 44 meters per second. Now, just to remind you, since it's been a long break and everything, the issue in every Doppler effect is that the, the, the condition for every Doppler effect 
is that either the source, well, a wave is transmitted from a source to a receiver. And then the condition for a Doppler effect occurring is that either the source or the receiver or both, sorry, let me say, the condition for a Doppler effect is that the source and the receiver are in two different reference frames relative to the medium. That the, that, that the source and the receiver are not moving at the same velocity relative to the medium. That's the condition for the Doppler effect. In other words, either the source is moving in toward the receiver or the source is moving away from the receiver or the receiver is moving in toward the source or the receiver is moving away from the source. Four basic possibilities. Any one of them means a Doppler effect will occur. What is the Doppler effect? The Doppler effect is a disagreement be between the source and receiver as to the measurement of the wave frequency. The source and the receiver will measure two different frequencies for the same wave if the source and the receiver are not moving the same way relative to the medium. That's what the Doppler effect is. So in every Doppler effect problem, you're given the frequency of the wave as measured by the source. In this case, that is FWS equals 500 Hertz. The source measures a, a sound frequency of 500 Hertz. And your goal in every Doppler effect problem is to solve for the frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver. And my board is about to disappear. So hang on a sec. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm taking too long with this. Um, just stop me if I'm gonna go on. I mean, stop me if any of this is not, this technically this is just a review of the scenario of, of the Doppler effect, the one that you did in your board meeting. And I know you already did it, by the way, I do know that. So I don't know why I'm talking about this for so long. Um, but um, but here's why I'm talking about it. Uh, Two things to remind you, no matter what Doppler effect you're doing, you're given the frequency of the wave relative to the source and you're solving for the frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver. That's the point of every Doppler effect. But a uh, problem. The thing, and you did that in your board meeting, we're going to go over your numbers as soon as I turn the page. But what but what I'm not sure that you fully got up to in your board meeting Um is that what we really want to see, the real purpose of this is not just to grind through the math, but to actually get the results of the Doppler effect, get the, the shifted received frequency for two cases and compare them. What I specifically want to do here is first get the answer for the case you did in the lab. The case you did in the lab is the one depicted right on this board. It's a case which, which we might call case two, the receiver receding, moving away from the source. I want to get the, the shifted Doppler frequency for that case. Like I want to get the answer for that, but then, or I want to review the answer you got in lab. But then what I very deliberately want to do is redo the Doppler effect problem with all the same numbers, but for a case where instead of the receiver moving away, where the source is moving away. And I want to get the answer for that. That's really my goal here, because I think in seeing those two answers in the comparison, we learn something about waves that is what we need to transition to electricity, frankly. Okay. So that's the goal. The goal here is to go over the answer that you got in the board meeting, but then compare it to an answer for a different case. So this is also all practice in the Doppler effect. I'm gonna to try to go faster now because I see I'm talking way too much about the same thing, but I, but I wasn't in your lab. I'm gonna trust you to stop me if I say something that's inconsistent with what happened in your board meeting or something that's confusing or something that never got cleared up. Um, to be super blunt, I, I did happen to sit in another section's lab when they did this and I watched how they all did it. And there were some things that they were confused about that I definitely wanted to straighten out in lecture. Now, I don't know, your confusions might've been slightly different. 
but I know that there were things that were either wrong or confusing in the other group. And my goal today was to straighten that out for them. I want to do the same thing for you, but I didn't see what you actually did. So I'm really going to rely on you to stop me when we get to a point that you didn't understand then, or that you understand differently from what I'm saying or something like I'm here to straighten out the answer that you got from your board meeting when you did it like a few weeks ago. In fact, I'm going to pause before I turn the page. Can I get a show of electronic hands if you're with me? Do you understand what I'm about? I want to go over what you got in the board. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so you're going to help. Okay, so thank you. That's good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Amy. Okay, that's good. That, I really appreciate it. All right, so you're going to stop me if I, wherever you need to, please do. Um, okay. And I'm assuming you're agreeing that these are the numbers. I mean, this is the case that you had. All right, so our goal, so I'm going over it. The goal is to get the frequency of the wave according to the receiver, given that the frequency of the wave according to the source was 500. Now, um, I'm going to turn the, I try to turn the page. Yeah, I, I'm going to say one last, let me just see what I did. Yeah, okay, okay. So I'm going to turn the page. Um, a couple of comments. This came up in the other lab. This might not have been true for you, but first of all, as far as pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses get very confusing in the Doppler effect. And I do know that there's an equation on the web that one can copy, and it seems like it solves all the Doppler effect problems for you by just plugging in, and it seems to save a lot of time and a lot of steps. I know that. I know it's very tempting to use the equation on the web. I will tell you right now that assuming that this problem appears on your final exam, which it often does, I mean, assuming there is a Doppler effect problem on your final exam, we we usually design the problem so that you can't just get through it with that equation on the web. We're kind of obnoxious that way. And if you even look at the way you did the, the board meeting, there were a lot of mini questions, subparts along the way, which that equation can't solve. One of the reasons we don't like that equation is that equation leaves it up to you to decide how to do the pluses and minuses. And it asks you to memorize like a lot of different, like do plus if this is the case and do minus if that is the case. And you end up having to memorize all these rules about plus and minus, which end up being just as confusing as not having that equation at all, I promise you. And end up, it takes just as much time and it leaves out any kind of like real physical thought. So what I wanna say, but I acknowledge pluses and minuses are the easiest things to get wrong in these Doppler effect problems. So first thing I wanna say, when you're setting up a Doppler effect problem as advice, before you go, before you start crunching any numbers, whichever way the wave is traveling, from source to receiver, call that positive. That is not a requirement, that is a strategy, but I would highly recommend it for any case of the Doppler effect you do. Like what I've done in red here, whichever direction the wave is traveling, call that positive. Anything that's going against the wave, call it negative. Um, that will save a lot of hassle. So you do that first. Second of all, I recommend putting two subscripts on every term. I know some instructors don't do that and some students don't do that. It's not a law, but in other words, even when you're writing frequency and wavelength, always put two subscripts. If you're talking about frequency or wavelength, things that strictly only apply to waves, then your first subscript is always a W, wave. Uh, so maybe you know some people leave that out because they think it's understood. Maybe it is, but I just think the whole problem is a lot easier and consistent and clear if everything has two subscripts on it. So that's just advice. I mean, again, I just noticed this was an issue in the other lab section. I don't know if it was an issue in your lab section, but that's just advice. So therefore, in this case, if we're following that, if we're following this idea of pluses and minuses, then VRM, if you look back at my picture, VRM, what they told us, they told us that the receiver is moving away from the source at 44 meters per second away from. That means it's moving in the same direction as the wave is traveling. So I'm going to make that positive. What am I making positive? I'm making VRM positive, the velocity of the receiver relative to the source. Uh, excuse me. The velocity of the receiver relative to the medium is positive. The receiver is moving through the air at positive 44 meters per second, because it's moving in the same direction as, as the wave. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second and add a page two.
right? Again, I'm saying over and over what the Doppler effect is, is the principle of relativity being applied to wave motion. The principle of relativity is this written right here. It's that all velocities are relations between pairs of objects. In the case of one object, the velocity of anything to itself is always zero. In the case of two objects, the velocity of me relative to you is always the opposite of the velocity of you relative to me, right? Velocities are symmetric. Um, and the velocity, and in the case of three objects, the velocity of me relative to New York City streets is the velocity of me relative to a subway plus the velocity of the subway relative to New York City streets, if you know what I mean, right? This is the nature of relativity. It applies to all velocities. And then we're saying it even applies to wave velocities, which are wavelengths times frequencies, right? It's what we're really saying is if you combine these two ideas together, you get the Doppler effect, that the velocity of a wave is its wavelength times its frequency, but that all velocities, including wave velocities, are relative in this way, right? So I'm just reminding you of that. So, so yeah, so the velocity of Rm is positive. That would mean, according to this, necessarily that the velocity of Mr, medium to receiver, is negative, right? Just bear that in mind. All right, so, so we said that, okay. So now I want to see, oh, there goes my board again. Hang on one second, it's coming. it's coming. Okay, so now in this case, in this case, part of the board meeting asked you to think qualitatively about this situation before you even crunch the numbers. And I just want to confirm, and I, again, I think this was probably clear to most of you. I mean, it was in the other section. In this case, we have a receiver moving away from a source. So qualitatively, I would predict, I would predict that if the receiver is moving away from the source, it, it, its measurements for wave frequency will be lower than the source measurements for wave frequency. I believe if I'm running, if you're sending waves at me and I'm running away from you, I believe I'm going to receive those wave pulses, those wave crests, less frequently than you're sending them, right? I mean, again, just picture like, like water waves at, 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 at Far Rockaway. If water ripples are being sent by some huge boat at three ripples per minute, if I stand at the beach and receive these ripples, I should receive them at three ripples per minute, right? Like they're, con they're being sent out at three, rip three crests per minute, and I stand there, well, then they're going to hit me at three ripples per minute. But if I'm running away while this is happening, right, even though they're being sent out at three, they're being made at three, transmitted at three ripples every minute. If one is coming to me, but I'm running away from it, it's going to take more time. I mean, three ripples per minute, it's going to take more than 20 seconds for the next one to hit me because what it would have been about to hit me except I ran away from that spot. So there's going to be more of a time delay between each next ripple. So the ripples will hit me less frequently than they were sent if I'm running away from them. And they'll hit me more frequently if I'm running into them, I think. And stop me if that doesn't make sense. So qualitatively, I'm saying, I believe we'll expect for this case of the Doppler effect that the frequency of the waves received will be some number less than the frequency of the waves as they were sent. What they were sent at 500 hertz. That was a given in the problem. So I am expecting we're going to receive them at less than 500 hertz. We now have to do the math to find the exact number, but we're hoping and we're going to check that we're going to get a number that will be less than 500, right? So now we have to do the math. And again, I know you did it in the board meeting. Hopefully you have your things in front of me, you, and you're. And hopefully you're going to see if I get the same answers as you got in the board meeting. But we're going to do the math. Now, here's the procedure for doing the math of any Doppler effect problem, meaning any of the four basic cases, four basic cases of receiver coming in, receiver going out, source coming in, source going out. For any of those cases, the Doppler effect procedure is uh, very elegant, I think, and very much the same thing. It has three steps to the procedure. You already have a five-step math 
a physics problem solving procedure in general, which I still expect you to use on the final exam and for the rest of your life and all of that. So I don't want to confuse you with a different, here's the point. If you're solving any problem, you do those five steps, right? But when you get up to step three and four of the general five step problem solving method, when you, if you're, if it happens to be a Doppler effect problem, then when you get up to steps three and four, I'm telling you right now, there's a very specific algorithm or script that you can follow specifically for the Doppler effect that I think would be tucked into steps three and four of the larger thing. So just to not confuse you, but to be a little bit silly, I'm going to call these three steps that you would do for Doppler effect. I'll call them stoops because a stoop is a step that's outside. I don't know. I'm calling whatever you want. You can call them planks, whatever. But here are the three stoops of the dop, and again, these would all be subsumed. These would all be, um, you know, contained. Within uh, steps three and four of the five step method. Okay, I hope that doesn't confuse. I mean, do whatever you want, obviously, but I hope that doesn't confuse me. Okay, but here's stoop A. Stoop A always is solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. You were asked to do this in the board meeting, right? You're going to solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. You're going to use V equals lambda F. That's what you always use. I mean, the two equations that we're running through in the, all the Doppler effect always is V equals lambda F and VAC equals VAB plus VBC, right? It's wave motion plus relativity is what makes the Doppler effect. So you solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source first by saying that the wavelength of the wave according to the source equals the velocity of the wave according to the source over the frequency of the wave according to the source. I'm just saying V equals lambda F, right? But I'm treating velocities relativistically as I should always do. So lambda WS equals VWS over FWS. Now, the key thing here to realize is that VWS is not actually a given in the problem. This is where the two subscripts thing really force you to keep track of what you actually really know explicitly and what you don't. I claim you don't explicitly know, explicitly, you are not given the velocity of the wave according to the source. That is not known. What is known always about a wave I mean, again, this is like where waves are contrasted with baseballs. The velocity of a wave, what's known about it before we even do anything is how fast it goes relative to its medium. How fast it's going relative to its source depends on what its source is doing relative to the medium. In other words, in terms of relativity, VWS is not given in the problem. VWM was given in the problem, but we can get from one to the other by saying VWS equals VWM plus VMS. That's, I'm just transposing the A, Bs, and Cs of the general relativity, I mean, of the, of the Galilean relativity statement in the prior page. So VWS equals VWM plus VMS, and then VMS, is that known? Well, explicitly, that wasn't given either. Explicitly, what was given is VSM. You were told the velocity of the source relative to the medium. What we know, according to relativity, is that VMS should always be symmetric with VSM, right? I mean, the, the Earth goes past the, sorry, yeah, uh, the, 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 the sun goes past the earth at 65,000 miles an hour from east to west. Therefore, the earth goes past the sun at 65,000 miles an hour from west to east, right? So we know that VMS must equal the opposite of VSM. What was VSM? Oh, well, that was given as zero. So, okay, it looks like a lot of work to arrive at a conclusion that maybe you already thought was evident, but, but this is the procedure that works every time. VMS equals the opposite of VSM. VSM in this case, in this case, was given as zero. So VMS equals zero. Therefore, right? In other words, what does that mean in English? Like the velocity of the source. I mean, the, the source in this case is not moving through the air. It's standing still in the air. Therefore, the air is standing still relative to the source. It doesn't feel any wind or anything like that. It's zero. So velocity 
of wave relative to source equals velocity of wave relative to medium plus zero. The velocity of the wave relative to the medium was 340. Notice. Um, notice the velocity of the wave relative to the medium is literally 340, like it's positive 340, because we set up a coordinate system that declared that whichever direction the uh, wave is going in is positive. So it makes that 340. That, that saves us a lot. Like we did that on purpose to save a lot of heartache and to keep as few negative signs going through as possible. I mean, to be super honest, again, like in the other lab section, they didn't make that choice. They made a different choice, which seemed convenient to them for other reasons. And their choice wasn't wrong. As long as you're consistent with your choice, you can make another choice. But they end up having they ended up having a lot of negative signs and they even ended up getting a wavelength that was negative, which is confusing, right? It's not strict. I mean, it is kind of strictly right. Well, it's certainly confusing. So my recommendation is call whatever direction the wave is going positive. That way your speed of uh, your velocity of your wave is positive and everything follows from that. All right, anyway, so now we solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. We get VWS over FWS equals lambda WS. So we get 340 over the given 500, right? And we get that the wave length of the wave according to the source is 0. 0.680 meters. And I believe, and you're, please stop me, but I believe that's what you got in your board meeting. Now that is not the ultimate point. That is step one of three or stoop one of three. We always start by getting the wavelength first. Also note that the equation on the web will not give you this information. So if we were to ask for it on a, if we were to ask for it on a um, exam, like you couldn't, you'd have to know how to do this. Um, so we get 0. 0.680 as the wavelength. The purpose of that, this is step one, to get us to the ultimate goal, which is frequency. The purpose of this wavelength is that it is the one thing we know to be agreed upon by both the source and the receiver. They will both agree, no matter what case we're talking about, they will agree on wavelength. I'm not saying the wavelength will be the same in all the cases. I'm, in fact, it won't be. I'm saying that within a given case, the source and the receiver will both agree on the wavelength. In fact, it's the only measurement that they will both agree on. That's why we focus on it. We get the wavelength according to the source first because we can and by the procedure we just did. And then we say, okay, in stoop B, step B, we say, okay, what's always true is that the wavelength of the wave according to the receiver is the same as the wavelength of the wave according to the source. The wavelength is invariant, non-varying, constant, regardless of which reference frame you're in. And this is actually a very important feature of wavelength. Like what we're physically saying is that, is that if I'm throwing waves at you, while either I'm running toward you or you're running toward me or you're running away or I'm running away, if there's motion between us while I'm throwing waves at you, we're saying that we're gonna disagree on a lot. Like our measurements will disagree on a lot and both of our measurements will be correct. Like a lot of relativistic, perspective oriented things are going to happen. For example, if I'm throwing waves at you while you're running away, we're going to disagree on the speed of the waves. We're all going to agree on what the speed of the wave is relative to the medium. We're all going to agree that the wave has to go in the case of sound at 340 meters per second relative to the air. But one of us is is moving through the air, which means that one of us will observe the air moving relative to us. Like if I'm running into the air, from my perspective, air is coming into me. There's wind, like, and that's not an illusion, that's reality. So even though we all agree that waves travel at 340 in the air, 
we're going to disagree on what the air is doing. And we're both going to be right in our frames of reference. And neither one of our frame of reference is like preferred or more legitimate than the other. So we'll disagree on what the air is doing. Therefore, we're going to disagree on what the speed of the wave is relative to us. And therefore, ultimately, since V equals lambda F, we're going to disagree on what the frequency of the wave is. That's like a lot of disagreement. But, and that's what the Doppler effect is all about. But notice the thing I just said. I said, because V equals lambda F, if we disagree on V, we're going to disagree on F. That's really what's going on in the Doppler effect. Let me say it one more time. V equals lambda F, but we are, in, we are observing two different Vs. Therefore, we're going to observe two different Fs. That assumes that we're observing the same lambda. Like, right? Like, let's just look mathematically again. Look at the equation. V equals lambda F. What I'm claiming is if I change V, I must change F. Yes, that is true. Assuming I don't also change lambda. Like if I change lambda, then it doesn't follow. But what I'm saying here is, oh yeah, no, lambda is what remains constant for both the, the source and the observer and the receiver. I'm going to say it one more time. V equals lambda F. The source and the receiver disagree on V, but they agree on lambda. Therefore, they disagree on F. Why do they agree on lambda? Because lambda is wavelength. It's how far apart the crests are. If you think about it, just think about it physically. If a ship is sending out three wave crests every minute to you, I don't care whether you're running toward those crests or running away from the crests, or even if the ship is running away from the crests or running towards, if the crests are three meters or, or whatever, two meters apart from each other, according to the ship, they're going to be two meters apart according to you. No matter what motion you're doing, that'll affect how far apart the crests are in time. But it's not going to squeeze or alter the space, right? I mean, at least in classic mechanics, right? I mean, assuming you're not like going close to the speed of light, um, you, right? Like, I don't care how fast you're running into those waves. If you run into those waves really fast, oh, you'll encounter them super often, super frequently, but they're still going to be as, but you, but you, by running faster, I mean, just like that's what means to go fast in general. If you want to get from here to McDonald's fast, you, if you run to McDonald's really fast, then you get there in a short amount of time because you took a given distance and you did it faster, but you don't, but by running fast, you don't literally make McDonald's closer to you. You just get there. Okay, you get my point. So the wavelength, I think you get my point. And if you don't, please put it in the chat. What I'm saying is wavelength is the one thing that source and receiver agree on within each case. Therefore, we solve for the wavelength according to the source first. That's stoop one. Then in stoop B, we say, okay, everybody has to agree on wavelength. Therefore, we're now going to use the wavelength we got at the receiver and we're going to run the same equations we just did in reverse. We literally first did V equals lambda F, and then we used relativity. So, so we use V equals lambda F to plug in F and get a lambda. Now we're going to plug in lambda into V equals lambda F and get out an F. We're literally just going to do the same thing backwards over at the receiver. If you're really following what I'm saying, you might think, well, then aren't you just going to run in circles like you wait a minute, you took an F, you plugged it into V equals lambda F to get a lambda. Now you're gonna take that lambda, plug it into V equals lambda F and get out a new F. Like, aren't you just running in circles? I would be running in circles, except for it's two different Vs. And that's where all the work comes in is to adjust the two different Vs according to relativity. So let's see what I mean. I go to step C now, I say, okay, F, WR equals VWR over lambda WR. Okay, just like I did before. And then just like I do before, I say, oh, but VWR, that's not explicitly given. No one told me the velocity of the wave relative to the receiver. What they told me is the, what I know always is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. So the velocity of the wave relative to the receiver, according to relativity, is VWM plus VMR, right? I'm doing the GPR form number four thing here. 
VM, uh, VWM plus VMR. Now what's VMR? I am ver being very careful, I'm following relativity. VMR, the velocity of the medium relative to the receiver. Like as in how fast is the air going relative to the ear that's hearing the sound? Well, that wasn't given to me in the problem, but what was given is something very related. What was given is the velocity of the receiver relative to the medium. The receiver was running through the air at positive 44. VMR is the opposite of VRM, right? I mean, that's what's written at the bottom of the page here. V, and, and I'm going step by step. Because again, some of these steps seem obvious in one part, but then they won't be obvious in the other part. So you just do all the steps carefully. Don't skip them and it'll all come out in the wash. VMR is the opposite of VRM. VRM was positive 44, therefore VMR is negative 44, okay? So I have VMR. So now I'm going to plug in VWR equals VM plus VMR. So VWR, v, velocity of the wave relative to the receiver, is 340 meters per second plus this negative 44 meters per second, right? I mean, so it's minus. So, so the so VWR is 296. But in English, what the heck am I saying? I'm saying the velocity of the wave relative to air is 340. Everybody agrees on that. That is a given about sound. It can't make that given about baseballs, but you can make that given about sound. It's going through the air at 340. But someone send someone is standing in the air, sending it out. They're standing in the air. So they, the source. They're standing in the air, so the air's not moving to them. So they say, oh yeah, the sound is going at 340 meters per second, even relative to me. But the receiver is running away from the sound, is running through the air. So yeah, the receiver also agrees, oh, sure, sound goes relative to air at 340, but this air is running away from me at 44, right? That, like, it's like wind to the receiver. It is wind to the receiver. So, so the, if you think of the air as a big box through which the sound is traveling, the receiver is running away from that box at 44. So the sound is not traveling to the receiver as quickly as it was being sent from the source. That's what we're saying in English. The sound is moving slower to the receiver. It's only going at 296 because the receiver is running away from it while it's coming. Okay, so the sound, the VWR is 296. So now we plug in the same equation as before. We're, we're now going to say we're going to solve for frequency is speed over wavelength. We're going to plug in that wavelength that both people agreed on. But the speed that we're plugging in now is a different number. It's, so we're not going in circles. We got 0.68 by dividing 340 by 500. Now we're dividing 296 by 0.68. So we're not going to get 500. What do we get? We get something less than 500 as predicted. We get 435 hertz. It's dramatically less than 500. If we were running even faster than 44, we would get a number even lower than 435. I'm going to pause for a second. We still have 16 minutes to get to the real point of all of this. But first of all, I believe that's the answer, the, the ultimate answer to the shifted frequency to the received frequency in the in one of the cases that you did in the board meeting like hopefully i'm going to wait for a second in the chat can someone confirm did you get that answer or does that look familiar to the first case that you did in the board meeting in lab like does that does that and it, yeah is that consistent with what you did in the lab so far Your hands or like okay thank you direct chat person i got one yeah um I got one. That's a little, I definitely, and since it's one, you know who I'm talking to you. Thank you, Ms. or Mr. One. Uh, looks familiar. Okay, guys, you're supposed to have these things in front of you, please. But okay, that's two people. Say, you, oh, okay. All right. So that's two people who might or might not be physics related to. Okay. But that's two. But does anybody else actually have that? Okay. Thank you. That's three people. Okay. Please, I was sort of hoping you guys had this in front of you, but okay. Well, all right, I believe that's the answer. Now, here's the thing. I kind of dragged that out as I always do, partly because it's been a week and a half and I'm not really sure what 
you remember or what you were clear on it is, is the all right wait is the procedure clear do you see that the procedure is you solve for the wavelength according to the source and then you use that wavelength to solve for the frequency according to the receiver i mean that i'm calling it a three-step procedure but honestly the second step of it is just noting that the wavelength has to be constant it's really two big steps and the two steps are just the mirror images of each other if you really follow, well, uh, anyway, I'm going to just see in the chat. Yes. Okay. Well, oh, that was the old. One. All right. I hope that's sort of clear because now I'm going to do it faster. I'm going to do it one more time, but a lot faster now for another case. I've got 14 minutes left. Here's the part of all this is to get you to know how to solve a Doppler effect problem. Like, yes, it's usually on the final exam, something like this. Usually, obviously, I'll let you know when we get there. Um, but the real purpose of this is to show you a compare and contrast. Like, what I want to do now is I'm gonna to compare to another case. I don't care what you call the cases, but in that case, I just did a certain set of values and I had the receiver moving away from the source. But the next case that in principle you did in the board meeting is all the same numbers, but the source moving away from the receiver, okay? And I'm asking you to make a prediction. I mean, I think we asked this in the board meeting and, and really we could, I, this is built for, I mean, I wish I could be there with you in the board meeting and like actually sit and just discuss and suspend this for a while, but to sort of cut to the chase now, I want you to predict, I do want you to predict on your piece of paper, if we keep all the same numbers, but we flip the case, should we get the same answer or not? Like, in other words, now, instead of having the receiver move away from the source at 44, we're going to have the source move away from the receiver at 44. All other same numbers, I mean, all other numbers being the same. Now, I'll tell you, again, this whole Doppler effect situation is driven by relativity. It's all about the fact that velocity is a relation between two objects, not a property of one, and that we get different numbers for velocities in different frames of reference from different, we see the world, we get different numbers in different perspectives and all unaccelerated perspectives are equally correct. In other words, if the earth sees the sun go past it at 65,000 miles an hour to the west, then the sun sees the earth go past it at 65,000 miles an hour to the east, and they're both equally correct. There's not, not one actual proper way to describe the situation. So I'm asking you to predict if we now take the situation and we move the receive we move the source back instead of the receiver back, would we expect the same results? I will sort of cut to the chase and tell you that. Given what I knew about relativity, if I had never done this before, I would think it'd be very reasonable to predict that we should get the same number. If I'm following relative, I would think, and I think that maybe many of you, if you're following all of this and you've been a good student for a semester and a half, I would think that receiver moving away from source should yield the same physical situation and the same ultimate values as source moving away from the receiver. Just like earth going away from sun is the same situation as sun going away from earth. That's what I would have predicted based on relativity. And I know relativity is playing a big role in all of this. So I'll admit to you that I would have predicted that I should get the same Doppler shifted frequency of the source. I would think that I'll get 435 again if I just run through these numbers, run these numbers through the same procedure, but with the source moving instead of the re receiver. That's what I would predict. Okay. But now I'm going to, in 11 minutes, I'm going to do the math again and we'll see what happens. If we do the exact same procedure again, but watch carefully, like you would do the same procedure, but zeros come up in different places and so forth. If I do the same procedure, I go to stoop A, I solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. So I do the same thing as before. I say it's V of WS over FWS. And then I say to myself, well, I don't know VWS. It's not given. What's given is VWM. So VWS must equal VWM plus, sorry, plus VMS, right? Just like before. But now here, this time, VMS is not zero this time. I have to, this is why I got used to the procedure in the other case. I practice a procedure because VMS is not always zero. In this VMS, remember, is the opposite of VSM. 
And in this case, VSM is a number. In this case, the source now is moving through the medium. Um, and it's moving back. It's move. If you look at the picture, the source is moving away from the receiver. And so if we call the direction of the waves positive, which I always do, before I even look at any numbers, before I look at any particularities of the case, this, the direction of the wave is always positive. So if the source is moving opposite to the wave, then the velocity of the source relative to the medium is negative 44, right? That according to that logic, Therefore, and but VMS has to be the opposite of VSM. So, B, so again, I'm telling you, if you're careful about this and you follow the same logic all the time, all the negative signs will fall into place for you. You shouldn't have to memorize anything or make any arbitrary decisions. But indeed, the negative signs, which are a big issue in all of this, will be taken care of if you logically say, aha, VMS has to be the opposite of VSM always, just like in the other procedure. And VSM was given according to my coordinate system, just like the other procedure. The other procedure happened to be zero. Here it's more meaningful. It's negative 44. So VMS is the opposite of negative 44. So we get positive 44. So the wavelength, according to the seeds of more work had to go into the wavelength this time. But I get that the wavelength is 384 over 500. So this time I get that the wavelength is 0.768 meters. Now I've got eight minutes left. Let's pause on this for a second. Obviously I'm not done. But notice that the wavelength according to the source this time is different from what I got in the other case. Note, in the other case it was 0.68 or some 0 0.680. Here it's 0 0.768. The wavelength is longer than it was in the other case. If you think about it, that sort of makes sense. Like I'm a, I'm a speaker sending out sound waves. I send them out in a certain way, you know, 500 every second. But as I send them out, I run back. So I send one out and I run back and then I send the next one out and then I run back and then I send it. So they're more spread out than they were in the other case. If the source is receding, we get an extended wavelength. Now you gotta be really careful about that. You might say to yourself, wait, I didn't need to say 15 minutes ago that the wavelength is always the same. Isn't that the whole point? Yes. We, so we go to stoop B. Within the case, any given case, the wavelength according to the source is the same as the wavelength according to the receiver. We'll both agree on what the wavelength is, but what the wave, we'll both agree. But what it is might not be the same as in the other cases. If I'm just standing still making waves, I'll make short waves. But if I'm running back while I make them, I'll make long waves. That's what's happening here in this case. It's extended wavelength. But everybody's still agreeing within the case. You see, I mean, that's a subtle distinction. you got to think about that in practice at home. But I'm saying, and that's why I'm a big fan of this procedure, because it takes care of all that. What Anyway. So Stu P says, oh, even if your wavelength is a surprising long wavelength that you didn't expect, still both you, the source, and you, the receiver, will agree on it. So let's now go to the receiver and say, okay, the frequency of the wave according to the receiver equals the velocity of the wave according to the receiver divided by the wavelength of the wave according to the receiver, right? So we do the same thing as before. And we say to ourselves again, but I don't know the VWR. I wasn't given in the problem. What I know is that VWR must equal VWM plus VMR. Same procedure. But I just look and I say, oh, aha, this time VMR is zero. You see, do you know, I'm just doing the same thing twice in every case. But in the other case, the zero came up first. And then in, in stoop A, and then stoop C, there was no zero. Here, there's no zero in stoop A, but there is a zero in stoop C. That's how it works. You're just tracking like where the zeros land and what the negative signs do, but it's the same. Anyway, so I get VWM plus zero over lambda WR, right? In other words, now I say, okay, the frequency, the final frequency that I'm solving for is 340 meters per second over 0.68. If you could, and I get a frequency of 443. It is lower than 500 as I would qualitatively expect. Like whether the receiver was running away while the waves were coming or the source was running away while the waves 
we're going. Either way, uh, yes, the received frequency is lower than the source frequency because we have spread out is occurring here, but it's not the same number for the two cases. This is the big punchline. If there is a, and it is a big punchline with five minutes left. I'm saying when the source moves away from the receiver or the receiver moves away from the source, we get the same qualitative effect, but we do not get the same quantitative effect. The received frequency in the first case is 443 hertz. The, uh, I'm sorry, it's 435 hertz. And in this case, it's 443 hertz. That's a difference. Is that an enormous difference? No, but it's big enough that I tell you this, it's a bigger difference than rounding the digits accounts for. Like we're sticking to three, I'm being a little bit careful about significant digits here. I got three for every thing I'm doing. Rounding alone would not account for that eight hertz distinction. And if you don't believe that, all you have to do is change the original speed of 44. Like this is all happening because one of the objects is moving at a certain non-zero speed relative to the air. The higher that speed is, the more dramatic effect this is. If you wanna make sure that this is not just happening because of rounding, instead of doing 44 meters per second, try 88 meters per second or 100 or whatever, or 200 meters per second, and you'll see an even more dramatic difference between these two numbers. What I'm trying to say is evidently frequency moving back from, I'm sorry. What I'm trying to say is source moving back from receiver is not the same effect quantitatively as receiver moving back from source. And that is not what I predicted. It's not what I would have expected. I would have thought if this is all about relativity, then me moving away from you should be the same thing as you moving away from me. Like, why should it make any difference? Three minutes left, I'll say, number one, if you follow the procedure we'll di we did, you will notice that physically it is different. In case one, we sent out an expected wavelength, but it's received at a higher speed, uh, excuse me, at a lower speed. Like in one case, we're sending out standard wavelength, but the guy, but, but the receiver is running away as he tries to catch that wavelength. So in case one, a standard wavelength is received at a slower speed, hence a slower frequency, lower frequency. In this case, we're sending out an extended wavelength, but receiving it at, at standard speed. It's actually a physically different phenomenon. In the case of the source moving, we mess with the wavelength right from the get-go. And then that messed up wavelength goes at an expected speed. In the other case, we send out an expected wavelength, but it goes at a messed up speed. Now, what does all that mean in English? Like, why is this not symmetric? as relativity might lead us to expect because, and I have two minutes left, but here's the big punchline. This is the thing that believe it or not, will get us into fields next class and for the rest of the classes of the semester. The thing that this shows, the fact that there's a Doppler effect that is different, whether the source is moving or the receiver is moving, shows what a vital and material role the medium is playing. In other words, Sun going past Earth is relativistically the mirror image of Earth going past Sun. That is true. There should be no physical difference in the phenomenon described by saying Sun is moving away from Earth versus Earth moving away from Sun. That is relativity, and that is applying here. However, what's applying here is that source moving away from medium is the opposite of medium moving away from source, while independently receiver moving away from medium is the same or is the opposite of medium moving away from receiver. What I'm saying is this is not about, this is relativity, it's 100% relativity, but the re relativity relation that's happening here is not the relation between the source and the receiver. We're not, it's false to think of this as whether the source is moving away from the receiver or the receiver is moving away from the source. They are not the relationship. The relation, the, what that to call them the relationship is to ignore the medium. The medium is a crucial real frame of reference in this whole phenomenon. The relation is between source and medium and medium and source or receiver and medium. 
and medium and receiver. There is no relation between the receiver and the source. What I'm saying is the fact that these numbers are different shows that we cannot ignore the medium. The medium is as real a player on the stage of motion here as any object ever is. It is a frame of reference for the kinematics. The medium is. So the symmetry applies to source and medium and receiver and medium, not between source and receiver. The medium cannot be ignored. That's what this is saying. The medium is real. Okay, that's that's the point of today. I mean, I can answer more questions about that on Wednesday. I don't think I'm, I'm I, I will get your exams to you, but I would not come into class Wednesday expecting it. You're gonna get them out. I, I apologize. I, mean, I am that far behind, just so you know. I have no defense, but I'm just letting you know. Um, okay, but that is class for today and there's no new homework for the moment. Um, I'll hang out if there's any. That, yes, have a great day. Thank you. Hey, professor, thank, thank you. Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.